So the court then imposed counsel. The problem was is if they had done it earlier, they could, and Milosevic um, uh, had said, I'm not going to, which he did, I'm not, you can, I don't recognize your counsel, I won't speak with them, and I'm just going to sit here. You know, okay, you don't have to defend yourself, you don't, you don't have to. Um, it's still the burden is on the prosecution to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, if the court had, Im what happened was that after the court imposed counsel, um, then all of Milosevic's witnesses boycotted. They wouldn't come to court. And this was like 100 witnesses refused to come to court. You know, the, the uh, Amici had been appointed as counsel. They contacted all those they could contact. Stonewall. They had a half a dozen. Stonewall otherwise. And this was, these were high officials in some cases. A Canadian uh, former uh, government official. They, you know, they didn't respect the court. They respected what Milosevic said. So that placed the court in a very difficult situation. You know, what do you do when um, there's, I mean, actually, you know, he doesn't have to put on a defense, but the court wasn't, wasn't going to be comfortable with that. Well, in the meantime, what happened was um, that the Court of Appeals overturned the um, trial court in appointing counsel for Milosevic. They said, you have the right to do it, but in this case, um, it's premature. You should still let him lead his case and have counsel sort of be standby. So nothing changed, actually, at that point. And then uh, a year and a half later, Milosevic was dead. Well, a year later, over a year later, Milosevic and was, was it, dead. Was it Stephen Kay that, at that point, tried to get out? Yeah. The, uh, the, the British barrister. <laughs> the court at the beginning of the trial, because he, Milosevic was representing himself, had appointed Amici Curiae to help the court, friends of the court. And they were supposed to raise issues that Milosevic didn't, you know, defenses that he had, evidentiary issues, those sorts of things. I don't think their role was ever clear. It certainly wasn't clear to all of them. Uh, and there was a Dutch, um, let's see, uh, the Amici were British, Dutch, and Yugoslav. And the Yugoslav um, uh, gentleman, who was very well respected in his own country and bar association, he wasn't used to practicing in that kind of a system. He didn't know what he was doing. And he, he couldn't not defend Milosevic. He didn't know how to not do that, or, or to say certain things like, um, well, you know, we all agree this is a civil war. Well, that was not a civil war, you know, and not everybody agreed that, and it was an issue. Um, so I'm sort of a rambling here, but uh, what happened, um, there are a lot of problems with the self-representation, and uh, ultimately, you know, when the, the appeals court overruled, Milosevic got to continue as he had before, and then, I don't know why this was, maybe it was foreseen and it just it was ignored. But at some point, Milosevic was going to get sick again, and then the standby counsel, the Amici, were going to have to come in, and, which happened. And the witness then said, I won't, I won't go on with cross-examination until Milosevic is back in court. There was a contempt hearing and he, a finding of contempt and you know, things went whatever. But with Kay, um, I was going to say, he was a, a well-respected barrister of Stephen Kay in the UK, highly respected. And his associate, Gillian Higgins, um, was an excellent you know, attorney as well. Well, they were, they were appointed at the beginning of the trial, so they sat through the whole thing. And when the court came to needing to appoint counsel, they turned to Kay and Higgins and said, you are going to be counsel for Milosevic. Milosevic wouldn't talk to them. And, and in fact, when they did cross-examine it or call, directly examine and call a few witnesses, Milosevic criticized that, which really affronted, I think, Stephen Kay, who was an excellent, excellent attorney. And so at one point, Stephen Kay said, ethically, I cannot you know, defend this man. My ethical rules say that if he won't give me direction and tell me what he wants to do with this case, I can't go on, and he will not talk to me. And the court said, no, you know, according to how we interpret the rules here, not your bar association, but here, um, you know, you have enough information that you can proceed to defend him, and you need to do that. And it went back and forth, and at one point, Kay actually threatened to walk out. Um, I don't know what changed his mind, but he did um, back down. And uh, at, later in the trial, the last three or four, five months of the trial, Milosevic did start talking to him, mostly because he wanted to get um, 
their assistance in trying to get um, medical um, a release to go to Moscow on a, for a medical uh, procedure, which the court denied. But that was what he was trying to work out, and he wanted to get asylum. We all think. But uh. can I can I make a, just a couple Please. of general points on self-representation? I'll try to keep it brief because I know it is, and that is, you know, Milosevic is certainly the paradigm case of uh, what I think, and, and and perhaps Judith does too. You know, an over uh, regard of the court for uh, appearances of super fairness at the expense of other parts of the system. But uh, just a couple of quick points. It's interesting, but uh, in the little booklet that I did on, on Tyrants on Trial, I tried to go through some other trials as well as the Milosevic. And it turns out these leaders do watch what the others do. It's, uh, it's been shown that, for instance, Saddam Hussein, who had not gone on trial yet at the time of the Milosevic trial, followed very closely Milosevic's conduct. Uh, maybe it would have gone that way anyway, but the number of techniques uh, are very parallel, and they're parallel, you know, going back to all kinds of other ones. I mean, to, to interrupt, uh, to call, well, Milosevic didn't call names, but many of the other uh, people abused the prosecutors. Uh, to boycott the, the prosecutors, to refuse to follow the rules. But one thing is, uh, many critics, and I think I include myself among them, think that the appellate court, the appellate chamber in the Molasic trial, went much farther in defining the contours of the right of self-representation than he had to, or even when basing it on, there was an American judge on the court who I think had a lot to do with writing the, the opinion, uh, based it on U.S. Visas versus Ferretta, which is our Supreme Court uh, case on self-representation. But I think the way they have applied it is much stronger than it is even in our own American courts. For instance, in our American courts, when you have self, federal courts, when you have self-representation, it is always, I think virtually, the practice to appoint a standby counsel. It's just, it just, that certainly, Judge uh, Brinkema did that in the Musawi case, which is one of the more recent turbulent uh, defendant kind of cases. She had to have him removed 30 times, I think, from the courtroom uh, at various times. But it, that's just a standard practice. Now, on the other hand, the appellate tribunal, not only in Milosevic, but in the later Sessel case where the defendant was even worse, was abusing, calling everybody names, et cetera. Uh, when the trial court did appoint counsel and it went up, uh, this one was, I think, even more flagrant, in my mm -hmm. view, than, no, than, than uh, Molossovich. What happened was he was misbehaving. He was later found to be in contempt for having leaked witness, confidential witness, witness material. He was you know, doing all sorts of things. And the trial court apparently uh, initially said, OK, we're going to appoint counsel, which is one of the standard approaches if a person uh, abuses the right of self-representation. It went up to the appellate court, and the appellate court said, oh, I know you had 20 counsel behind the scenes, which they all do. They all have up to 20 counsel who are gi giving them memorandum, et cetera, but can't necessarily come in the courtroom. Uh, but they can you know, stand outside <laughs> practically and, and, and counsel them. And they said, well, we, and they had all told him, if you misbehave, of course, they're going to be, and the judge had initially warned him, if you misbehave, this right may be taken away from you. So the appellate court says, when he did appoint counsel, oh, but the judge didn't tell you this time specifically that if you did that, you would have appointed counsel as one of the sanctions. Just told you generally you would be sanctioned. So therefore, we're going to reverse that. We're going to reverse the appointment of counsel here. It goes back down, uh, and, and, and you go back to your original status. And only if you do something more that's wrong, and you are specifically warned that that will result in having counsel taken away, appointment of counsel, then it's the only reason. So the original thing had been a standby counsel that the original trial judge had appointed in that case. And it went back to the standby counsel. And he objected to the, uh, Seychelles objected to the standby counsel, whom he didn't like. Uh, not too many people of these like their counsel at this point. And so he said, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go. I'm going to boycott the trial, et cetera. It went up on appeal. And this time the appellate 
uh, division says, oh, well, maybe, maybe we didn't, maybe we weren't clear enough. Maybe we weren't clear enough. And maybe in, people interpreted that as saying you couldn't have the standby council that had been there from the original time. So you won't even have to have the standby council, at which I think the trial judge just removed himself from the case and they appointed another one. Mm -hmm. But there, there has, I mean, this is the, the other two things on, on, on self-representation, which need, it's enormously expensive. Now, Milosevic spoke some English, and Karadich, who's uh, representing himself, speaks enough too. But if you get a defendant who doesn't speak English, then these thousands and ten thousands of pages of discovery material, which normally a counsel who has to speak either French or English to be admitted to the bar, you know, will will have them filed in. They all have to be translated for him, which takes enormous number. It took ten months to translate one document into Yugoslav, uh, et cetera. So they all have counsel who are paid, not at regular counsel rates, but at some assistant counsel rates, up to, I mean, five, six, seven counsel behind the scenes, even though they're getting up and representing themselves. They're not subject to the same kind of discipline a lawyer is. I'm not against self-representation when it's, when it's uh, you know, obviously pursued responsibly, but I do think the court, uh, the appellate division has created a somewhat of a schism with the trial court trial court is generally who is there and has to deal with this every day. It's generally been responsible before they have appointed it, but they have, you know, they've lost, uh, as somebody said, it'll be a long day before somebody else will appoint counsel anymore because it goes up to the appellate division and they come up with some uh, reason why it shouldn't uh, stick. So I, I hope, we can only hope that the ICC and even uh, some of the future ICTY cases on appeal uh, you know, that they are a little bit more cautious in the way they have uh, done this. Incidentally, in the United States does not represent the, the Constitution, does not, federal, Supreme Court does not recognize a right to self-representation on appeal. Only in the trial court. Ah, but the ICTY represents, uh, uh, recognizes it on appeal, which is like, you know, if you're really so bent on following Anglo-Saxon precedent, we don't even have that anymore. Anyway, um, that's, uh, I think the other, the last thing I'll say is that there's also a debate even among the ICTY judges with whom I had the privilege of talking about this subject in one of their retreats as to whether or not you should ever allow the accused to question witnesses. And the practice here, never mind self-representation or not, the practice is divided. In many countries, even if you have a counsel, you can ask the judge if you're the defendant, if you can question the witnesses. And indeed, in Saddam Hussein's case in Iraq, even though he did have counsel to begin with, the judges let him do the questioning. There's a real debate as to whether or not some of these not only perilous witnesses, victim witnesses, but even so-called insider witnesses, people who are still in the army or the civilian um, officialdom of that country and may have to deal with this defendant's buddies, et cetera, uh, are very nerve, you know, are, are going to be extremely intimidated, even if he doesn't uh, overact. So there, there's a strong, in the United States, if you're a defendant, you can't, um, you can't question the, uh, normally, you can't question the uh, witnesses, et cetera. Um, so these are some of the issues which are still going to be out there in these trials.